As such, I thereby conven convene by the power vested in me, panel G4, which would be the Cold War. Dr. Sati Flatshack from the University of Jos is going to speak with us on the Cold War and the emergence of economic divergencies in Af Africa and Asia compared. You simply tell me when to. Uh, you simply tell me when to click it, and I'll click it for you. Okay. So I'm going to do. Oh, I'll open it from here. Yes. Good afternoon, my dear participants at this conference. I'm speaking on this topic <coughs> on the screen. And my interest in that question, or in this topic, arose from this question that persists in Africa, particularly these questions that arise from my students. Why is it that Asia developed ahead of Africa, in spite of their sheer heritage? I didn't know the answer. And I did some little readings, and I found that the Cold War was partly responsible. So I then went further to find out the specifics involved in the creation of this uh, divergence. Now, the Africa I'm considering in this lecture or in this paper is not the whole of Africa, although by implication it's the entire of Africa. However, the major part of Africa that I'm dealing with is Sub-Saharan Africa. And Sub-Saharan Africa, we all know, is regarded as the poorest, uh, illiterate, uh, with high illiteracy uh, levels, with levels of uh, unacceptable human conditions, to say, uh, if, if we can use those words. Then, Asia is also de defined in a circumscribed manner. It's not the entire Asian region, but I'm dealing with the countries that otherwise were said to have performed a miracle, or the highly industrializing, uh, highly high-performing East Asian countries or societies, or the newly industrializing countries. Now, I exclude China because China was one of the parties in the Cold War. So even though China is part of the Asian miracle, it is not part of this study because I want to um, define it in a different manner. Now, by the 1950s, these Asian countries had many things in common with Africa. They were both non-industrialized societies, exporting basically primary goods, minerals, agricultural resources, with very poor socioeconomic conditions, low growth levels, in fact, at below 1%, with high levels of poverty, illiteracy, low health status, and so on. In fact, by the 1950s, according to literature, Japan was so poor that it couldn't even qualify for a World Bank loan. But by the 1990s, the difference was clear. Africa still retained its 1950s status. But the Asian countries had been declared as miraculous region. 25 years of sustained growth reduction in poverty rates, industrialization, shared growth, and so many characteristics of the emerging industrial world. So, scholars again try to explain this, particularly led by the World Bank, and they, they ask the question, why did Asia move so fast? And the policy, I mean, the, the, the answer they gave was that the difference was in policy options. Asia went for the market system, Africa went for state-led growth. But in the literature of the development of those periods, they had those same characteristics. In fact, the development of Asia was not based on any full acceptance of the market system, but rather it was a combination of dictatorships with even protectionism. It has to be found in some other explanations. The Cold War does not explain all of it, but I think it contributed a lot. And what's the contribution of the Cold War? For me, it is in the creation of divergent environments and opportunities. I look at this um, more 
elaborately. Sorry, this is this is some for the wrong slide. Oh, shoot. Just back. Yeah. All is that right. it? Or no? Yeah, that's the correct one. Ah, this one? Yeah. Um, yes, yes, get, get to two. Yeah, we're, we're past this one. And this one? Yeah, that's it. <coughs> um, okay. Now, what is the Cold War environment and the opportunities offered to Asia? One major thing occurred. The United States made an arrangement with many of the Asian countries, including some countries in the Pacific Basin. It was a special arrangement which gave security, guaranteed the security of those Asian countries, and granted them market and technological access to US markets and technology. And in that arrangement, the agreement was that the Asian countries and those countries in the Pacific Basin will sign an agreement that they will reject communism. If they did so, then they will have guaranteed security, market access, and technological access. And they agreed and resisted communism and had those accesses. What is the benefit of those things? They reduce a lot of money, they save a lot of money in military spending. Africa was buying arms, these ones didn't have anything to worry about security. And Japan, for example, only started picking its military bills in the 1970s when it was regarded as having grown. Then another benefit was that they focused on economic performance. So that by the 1960s, they had started their processes of industrialization. South Korea, for example, started under General Park in the 1960s, Malaysia in the 1970s, Indonesia in the 1980s. And they had this because of that uh, arrangement with the United States. Another benefit was that the United States traded ben uh, extensively with the Asian countries. And in fact, in the process, the United States was losing. So the United States was making sacrifices for Asia. And between 1982 and 1987, the U.S. incurred a four-fold trade deficit with Asia, particularly Japan. So Japan was, however, making inroads into the American market. And by, between 1985 and 1990, Japan's investment in the U.S. was worth about $5 billion or $59 billion. Another aspect of the benefit was that the United States um, foreign direct, uh, direct investment in Asia was huge. And much of it went to Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan. And then between 1950 and 1970, Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan also benefited from the United States' low-cost technology transfer and thousands of technical data packages. So the benefit was not just um, military. It was also economic. Now, in general, Asia also benefited from aid and foreign direct investments from other uh, countries, from the USSR, where much of their aid went to Asia, the Middle East, United Arab Emirates, and then Vietnam, Cuba, Mongolia, and so on. Then more of aid of the DSC countries went to Asia again, and they got about 12 billion out of the 20 billion that was available. Japan, when it started growing, also concentrated its foreign direct investments in Asia particularly China, Indonesia, Hong Kong, Thailand, and so on. Now, what did Africa get from the Cold War? Instead of security, it got instability. It was the theater of proxy wars. Both sides of the Cold War divide sponsored their armies, gave military aid in, uh, in armed supplies, training, and supply of troops to fight wars in Africa. Russia did not come to fight in the United States, but it was fighting in Angola. The Angola did not go to fight in Russia, but it was fighting, I mean, US was not fighting in fighting Russia, but it was fighting in Angola. So the African countries became the theater of color. And this was the tradition where armed struggles were the main means of securing independence, particularly in Angola, Mozambique, Cape Verde, Algeria, and so on. So, this was one aspect of the instability. The other aspect was that 
Some African leaders were as eliminated as part of the Cold War regime. We all know the, the, the story of Patrick Lumumba. There was an attempt at NASA, but it didn't succeed. Then another aspect was direct attacks, in which, for example, in 1956, the United Kingdom, France, Israel, went and attacked Egypt over the Suez Canal because NASA, the, 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 the Western countries withdrew their place to give him a loan to build the Suez Canal, a uh, swam dam. Now, when they withdrew their pledge, he now went to Russia, and the Russians said, we will we'll give you. Then they said, no, he must be a pro-communist uh, agent, and we must deal with him. And they went and invaded his country. Only God saved him from being killed. <laughs> the impact of this instability, we can imagine. Loss of lives, property, revenues in arms transfer. Asia was going to sleep with its head clean. These guys had many things to worry about. Now, another aspect of the instability was ideological confusion. Africans were asking themselves, do we go communist or do we go capitalist? And even in the context of that argument, is it the Chinese model we are going to follow or is it the Russian model we are going to follow? And then, the two superpowers that were involved in the Cold War also created deep divisions within African society. They penetrated workers' unions, penetrated students and youth organizations. In uh, workers' unions, for example, Russia formed the World Federation of Trade Unions. Then the United States brought its own International Confederation of Trade Trade Unions. Russia formed World Federation of, uh, the United States formed World Federation of Democratic Youth. Okay. The Soviet Union formed International Students Association. So Africa had confusion, those guys had organization. Africa had no market and technological access as these people had. Well, Britain took many of them after independence to the EEC, but Africa continued to be marginal. Its share of the international market continued to decline, as you can see from that statistic. And by the early 21st century, the United States started a program called uh, uh, AGOA, African Growth and Opportunity Act, and Europe brought what they call everything but arms. The purpose was to enable Africans sell goods in the international system. But what were the kinds of goods? They all had their own restrictions. And so Africa did not have the desired entry into the uh, world market. So in conclusion, the difference is in the environment. What environment did the Cold War create for Asia? Peaceful environment, marketization environment, developmental environment, technological progress environment. In Africa, instability, confusion. I want to thank you. Next up will be uh, will be Dr. Leslie James from the London School of Economics and Political Science. Huh? Okay, not well then. Then Miss Leslie James from the London School of Economics and Political Science, uh, with her paper "Playing the Russian Game: The Writings of George Padmore and the Labeling of African Resistance as Soviet Propaganda." Uh, do you need the AD somewhere? No, okay. that's fine. I'm just gonna okay. give it. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, so before I start, I'll just give you uh, a brief context. Um, the title of my paper is Playing the Russian Game, George Padmore and the Labeling of African Resistance as Soviet Propaganda, 1946 to 1950. I should say that um, I'm focusing on West Africa primarily, um, and I, most of my research has looked at newspapers in Ghana and Nigeria, um, and Padmore's role in them. This paper comes uh, came out of research I was doing for my PhD, which is a biography of George Padmore, um, which is why Padmore plays such a heavy role in, in my paper and in my research. Um, for those of you who don't know uh, much about Padmore, I'll just give you a brief idea, and most imp the most important information you need to know for this paper is that um, he was a key Pan-African leader in the first half of the 20th century. He's Trinidadian. Um, but moved to the U.S. in the 1920s, became a communist, um, and became very radicalized and was recruited in 1930 to the Soviet Union, where he worked leading what they called their Negro Bureau at the time, 
um, until 1933 when he left the Communist Party and the Communist International and was no longer ever affiliated, although he maintained his Marxist ideas, he was never again affiliated with the Communist Party. But the reason you need to know that is that his past with the Communist Party and with the Soviet Union, he has to confront that again when the Cold War emerges. Um, and so the quote, the part of my title comes from a quotation from a colonial office memo uh, in the Public de Relations Department in 1946, which read, the fact that Padmore is supposed no longer to be affiliated to a communist organization is no argument for not treating his efforts as if they were inspired by Moscow. Whatever their source, they are likely to have the same effect. <coughs> he is playing the Russian game even if he is not paid to do so. So this memo comes from um, files I was looking at in the colonial office which show that between 1946 and 1952 when Cold War tension between Britain and the Soviet Union manifested itself primarily uh, in Soviet criticism of Britain's empire, that the British Foreign and the Colonial Office were carefully watching Soviet propaganda in their colonies. Uh, in all the reports, they, they sent out a memo in 1946 requesting quarterly reports from all colonies across the British Empire on Soviet propaganda in their colonies. What, you, what I found was that in all of these reports coming back from across the empire, Padmore is the only person ever mentioned by name. This, the appearance of an article by Padmore, regardless of its content, was reported consistently in West African and West Indian newspapers, or sorry, in West Indian reports. This did not occur in, in any other reports, nor with regard to any other individual. In these years, Padmore produced both newspaper articles and books that challenged the form and legitimacy of the British Empire. In the same six-year period, the Soviet Union launched an attack on British imperialism, primarily through the United Nations. It's within this context that the British reacted to the availability in colonial territory of books and newspaper articles published by Padmore. So my paper will highlight the predominance of Padmore in colonial government reports of Soviet propaganda and the specific threat Padmore invoked by writing about the Soviet Union challenging Britishness and criticizing colonial development policy. It begins by analyzing his journalism primarily in West African newspapers within the context of colonial censorship, his political alliances, and the emerging Cold War. And I'll, I'll then examine the attempts made by the British Foreign and Colonial Office to control information in the colonies and the constraints placed upon its attempts by the drafting of a UN Declaration of Human Rights. I will argue that since it was not Padmore's writing about the Soviet Union that was the primary objection, but his criticism of British imperialism, the rhetoric of the Cold War was used as a convenient category not only for labeling African nationalists, um, and probably most famously Kwame Nkrumah in the early uh, Cold War period was labeled a communist, but also for suppressing free speech in British colonies in general. So Padmore's paper the primary newspaper in this period was Namdi Azikiwe's Nigerian serial, The West African Pilot, although his articles increasingly appeared in the Gold Coast newspaper, The Shanti Pioneer, until by 1949 and 1950, Padmore held the headlining spot almost every day in this newspaper. His articles were thus central to the growth of many of these West African papers. As Kiwe had returned to native, his native Nigeria in 1937 after studying in the U.S. with Padmore where they became friends in the uh, late 1920s. By the late 1940s, as Kiwe had developed an impressive newspaper re group referred to as the Zeke Press. These papers were known for their provocative headlines and modern print techniques and articles from the press were frequently reprinted across the Atlantic and West Indian newspapers. And we can talk about this more in question time if you'd like, because my research uh, looks a lot at the dialogue between West African and West Indian newspapers at the time. The West African pilot based in Lagos reached its peak cir circulation in 1950 with 50,000 copies, which was the largest circulation at the time in West Africa. The focus of Padmore's journalism in the first two years after the war was in three areas. First, the Labour Party betrayal of its earlier stance on colonialism. Second, race relations. And third, Anglo-Soviet relations as they related to the colonies. He argued forcefully that those who, quote, claim they are left-wing socialists can only think of Africa in terms of exploitation. However, his emphasis gradually turns um, away from writing about the Labour Party in, 
um, in 1948 and away from writing about the Soviet Union to focusing on the exploitation of colonial development policy and the power of Africans could wield in Britain's desperate attempt to revive its economy. In terms of colonial development policy, the most famous thing that he attacked and the most famous thing at the time was the failed groundnut scheme. This change um, towards writing away from the so not writing about the Soviet Union may have partly occurred because Pat of Padmore's growing awareness of the colonial office attacks on the West African press. In the summer of 1947, he announced that the colonial office was working with the British tabloid, uh, the Daily Mirror, to bring out Mirror Group newspapers in Nigeria and the Gold Coast with the object of challenging African-owned newspapers. The Gold Coast press staunchly resisted the imposition of British papers and denounced the accusation of communism. For example, one editorial in, uh, in the Ashanti Pioneer proclaimed that, quote, the Gold Coast, in sober fact, has no intention to go red. Rather, it has seen red. Goaded by the forces of organized, brutal exploitation, the masses of the Gold Coast are now resolutely out for just redress. So in challenging British development policy as exploitation, Padmore was very specific in explaining Britain's economic dependence upon the colonies. The logic behind the heightened interest of the colonial office in development policy was, Padmore argued, a direct result of Britain's dollar crisis. The colonial office line that they were engaged in development in order, to, in order to help the millions of colonial inhabitants who were, quote, living in deplorable conditions, was a base lie in Padmore's eyes. He became increasingly aware that this lie was being used also as a means of countering colonial demands for independence of those who were, as poor, diseased children, quote, unfit for self-government. The attitude, I'm sure, as I'm sure many of you are familiar, the attitude of treating Africans as children was common in the colonial office, uh, and it's manifest in, in my research as well here, and it had important implications for the attempts to label Padmore's writing. The African as emotional, reactionary, and irrational was generalized into a larger criticism of the African press, and it was the means by which um, the British rationalized their, their attempts to suppress the press. Uh, and the same thing occurs with Padmore's writing. His articles were often considered, sorry, often categorized as exaggerative and devoid of fact. So Padmore produced both newspaper articles and books in this period. In 1946, his book came out, How Russia Transformed Her Colonial Empire. And this book, um, made a very popular argument in the European left at the time that uh, Russia had a more advanced, uh, was much more advanced in terms of race relations than the West was. But in 1949, he produced another book called Africa, Britain's Third Empire. And the important point for my paper and for my argument is that it's not his book on Africa that is banned in, uh, sorry, it's not his book on Russia that's banned in Africa, but his book on uh, British imperialism in Africa that ends up being banned in 1950 by six different African colonies. So what I argue this shows is that the concern was not for Soviet propaganda, but for anti-imperialist writing on Africa that encouraged African nationalist movements. So what you see in the reports coming back from the colonies uh, in 19, is that in 1946 and 1947, it, Padmore's articles are described as being pro-Soviet, but by 1949, there's a subtle shift in the reports coming back. Padmore's articles are no longer mentioned for their Slavonic content, but for their, quote, anti-white, anti-British character. The elements of national and racial consciousness present in this description by the governor of the Gold Coast exposes an underlying fear that was present in the decade after the war. A dramatic increase in immigration from Britain's non-white colonies, particularly the West Indies, invoked a reassertion of white British nationalism in Britain that sought to redefine non-white immigrants as strangers and thus not British. Padmore's anti-British writing thus took on a much deeper elemental danger that challenged national conceptions of identity. Attacking Padmore's writing along moral lines could therefore prove very useful. Labeling anti-colonial writing as Soviet propaganda had the added benefit of placing threats to British imperial authority in a very recognizable oppositional uh, category that both the British public and British and colonial officials could identify. The Soviet propaganda label conveniently undermined the moral authority claimed by anti-colonial activists by associating criticism of the British Empire with what was swiftly becoming a symbol in the West of oppression and tyranny. 
British attempts to control Padmore and the African press were intertwined because these newspapers supported Padmore, and Padmore's articles enhanced the content of the newspapers. Unfortunately for British officials, in attempting to control Padmore and the burgeoning West African press, they faced new international laws on human rights. So, um, and this is primarily the UN Declaration on Human Rights. So the UN Declaration on Human Rights was passed in de on December 10th, 1948. In the, in the year before this, the Colonial Office and the Foreign Office were quite quiet um, about how to suppress um, dissent in the colonies because they were waiting to see what was going to happen with the, with the human rights, whether it was going to be a covenant or a declaration meaning how legally binding was it going to be and how much could they actually get away with in the colonies. So once the declaration is passed, uh, the colonial office drafts a memo to all colonial governors on uh, directions for how they can suppress um, resistance. Um, and the Secretary of State for the Colonies argue, notes to colonial governors that it's not a legally binding document, it's not going to be implemented for many years, and therefore, Article 19 of the document, which, um, which is, 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 protects freedom of speech, um, is, is not generally applicable, and, and they can get around it for a little while. So he drafts this memo. Um, it's sent to the Foreign Office and then to the Prime Minister. Um, the Prime Minister then sends it to the Attorney General, who's in the UN at the time. Uh, and the Attorney General responds by saying that he agrees with the memo, he agrees with the suppression, um, and he agrees that the declaration is not a legally binding document and they can get away with it. However, there's no use pretending that it's not completely contradictory to English law and to the UN Declaration on Human Rights. Once the Attorney General um, states his objection, the Prime Minister cancels the draft memo uh, and, it's, and it's never sent. So what I argue is that this shows a previously unidentified instance where the new Universal Declaration actually did deter a government initiative to suppress dissent. Um, and all of the above that I've been discussing culminates in the banning of Padmore's book, Africa, Britain's Third Empire, in, 19, uh, in 1950. There's, um, there's a lot of, dis of objection to, to this, and they use Article 19 especially to object to, uh, to the banning of the book. But, I, I'm going to cut through that in the interest of time. So, in conclusion, the burgeoning West African press, with Padmore as the central figure, became a threat to British imperialism in the post-war period. Its suppression involved sending a, a public relations rep to Nigeria on a permanent basis and setting up pro-British newspapers. The banning of books, however, became increasingly difficult after Article 19 of the UN Declaration was passed that anti-colonial writing became Soviet propaganda is important for understanding the role of the early Cold War in African politics. And that Padmore's work had, among colonial office and colonial government staff, become associated with Soviet propaganda despite explicit knowledge that he had rejected the Soviet Union, reveals the pervasive presence of Cold War rhetoric in daily colonial governance. In this sense, both Padmore and the British officials who labeled his work Soviet propaganda can be said to have been playing the Russian game. Thank you. Speaking next on the topic, we have Dr. Cranston Knight, who I believe is now at St. Augustine College, who uh, is presenting on Cuba and South Africa, Regionalism and Internationalism, Ideology and Conflict in Southern Africa during the Cold War. Dr. Knight. Okay. In my particular paper, I was very interested, I, I apologize, I, I recently had oral surgery, so I sound a little muffled. Things won't come out quite the way I would like them, so I apologize. Uh, in my research, I was very interested in Cuba's involvement in uh, African liberation movements, and particularly in Angola and, and Namibia. Um, likewise, I was also interested in how the South Africans were able to frame um, the colonial movements as a movement that was caused by communism and that it was the Soviets who were directing the movements. So you get a clash of ideologies, you get an internationalism, which was Cuba, Cuba's foreign policy, and you get a ideology that 
from the, from the South Africans' position that it's actually communism that's fueling these conflicts. Never mind the fact that they have an apartheid government, and never mind the fact that you have nationalism moving across the continent. That was never taken into account. What's taken into account is the fact that the Soviets are behind all of the, uh, the uh, disarray and conflict which are taking place. We can, frame, uh, we can frame the Cold War as the period between 1945 and 1989 when the United States and the Soviet Union faced off with each other, almost causing a nuclear uh, showdown. Both countries were uh, militarized and were highly visible and close to war during the Berlin Conference crisis, the crisis in um, Korea, Vietnam, Russia's involvement in Afghanistan, the Cuban Missile Crisis, but in the final analysis, they did not go to war against each other, and this becomes a very important point. Instead, both countries fought each other through proxy militaries during this period, and no country was immune from great power politics. It was a global war of contested spears, fought in Latin America, Africa, and Asia, and sovereignty was a moot point. Both sides intervened in countries to bolster their own interests, overthrowing governments and sending arms and military advisors <clears throat> to opposing militias in which millions died. It was what Otto von Bismarck called a test of blood and iron. During the same time period, however, within various countries, you also had regional conflicts, which had nothing to do with the United States or the Soviet Union. But these conflicts took on the appearance whereby both the United States and the Soviet Union were dragged into the, uh, the great, the small power and regional conflict themselves. South Africa moves as a regional power coming from out of the Boer War. It felt that it needed safety, and safety for the South African military was having buffer zones. So that South Africa at one point, particularly during 1960, there was West Africa, Mozambique, Angola, and Rhodesia on one side, as well as Malawi, Botswana, Swaziland, and Swoto on the other side. All of these composed what the South Africans called their security zones. They were able to produce goods and services because many of these countries were landlocked. They could use the railroad to get their goods and services from the internal, from internally to the coastal area where they could be sold. And they maintained the South African um, hegemony in the sense that it maintained the white minority population. All of this combined gave them a buffer zone against what they considered to be black nationalism. South Africa moved toward totality and hegemony, and the way it was able to do that was, one, it allowed both goods and services, and it also allowed for military alliances between Rhodesia and the Portuguese-held areas. Uh, South Africa was also very interested in Angola because Angola had, was rich in oil, diamonds, and coffee plantations. So South Africa is able to move from a position of simply being a country which holds apartheid as one of its major points to being seen as a regional power because it's a collective of what is considered to be other states in which they are actually the facilitators of goods and services, and also arms. As the Cold War continues on, the South Africans move from a position of looking at black nationalism to the point of maintaining that it is the Soviets which are intervening in these countries because they want a deep water port and they want the minerals and diamonds that South Africa has in it within its continental borders, and it asked for the U.S. for help to make sure that the Russian forces do not take and, be, and become involved in this particular uh, foyer. The Cubans on the other side developed what's called Cuban internationalism. Their national uh, 
independence movement was Jose Martin. Martin viewed Cuba's struggle as one of liberation, but also liberation of the Americas. He maintained that during the early years of Cuba when it is fighting, it is fighting not only to liberate itself, but to liberate the world. You'll see this also played out when the Cubans are fighting in uh, Spain during the Spanish Civil War. All by itself, Cuba introduced more uh, volunteers to fight against fascism than in any other country. The Cuban Revolution, which took place later on against, against Batista, as Castro maintained, as many other Spaniards have maintained, that the whole issue of the Cuban Revolution was not only to liberate themselves, but to liberate all countries which had been held under colonialism, and that could only take place through revolution. Russia's self uh, sorry, Cuba's self-defense also maintained that the only way that it was going to ever uh, free the world from colonialism was to revolt, and that they were the, to be the vanguard guard of the revolution itself. Che Guevara, in many of his speeches, particularly the one to the United Nations, maintained that armed struggle was the only way that liberation could be achieved. Also through uh, internationalism, race and race consciousness became important because of many of the Afro-Cubans who lived there, and so they maintained that internationalism was not only to free countries but to colonialize, but to end racial oppression. Therefore, they were uh, part and parcel of the liberation movements in Africa. As Castro made it very clear, uh, Cuba was an Afro-Latin country, and that they were an African people, and that it was their job to protect Africa. Thus, the liberation movements which were taking place, they had to become part and parcel of it, which they did. Once the Cubans became involved in the African movements, they helped swap and, and swap swap and South and South. I'm sorry, I'm having difficulty speaking. They became very involved in Angola as well as in Namibia. They helped the, the ANC, and they gave uh, lots of money to as well as arms to Mozambique. The Cubans helped Palimo uh, in their struggle. They helped Dino in their struggle in Zimbabwe. They continued to help Robert Mugabe, although Mugabe was more prone towards the uh, Chinese. But in the final analysis, as the Cubans said, you may dislike our nationalism, you may dislike our Marxism. In the final analysis, you need individuals who will help make your government a functional one. So thousands of people from um, Mozambique went to Cuba as doctors. They went there for training. They also went there for education. And as Castro makes it very clear, you're not going to have a self-sustaining government if you do not have educated people. As the tides are changed in Africa, and we have more and more countries become liberated, particularly in Southwest Africa, and particularly in Angola, the MPLA the FNLA and UNITA combined on the eve of liberation in that particular country. <clears throat> upon liberation, <coughs> upon the eve of liberation, the uh, three factions could not get along very well. And <coughs> South Africa and the United States backed Palimo and UNITA. The Cuban forces backed the MPLA. The three factions could not get along and therefore went to, into civil war. Okay. I'll wrap this up very quickly. The MPLA uh, and Cuban troops fought against the South African forces. It was the largest battle in, uh, uh, second largest uh, battle in African history, the first being between the uh, British and the 
Germans, the second largest tank battle in African history took place between the Cubans and the South African forces. The Cuban forces fought tenaciously in the first uh, Angolan War in 1975. 36,000 Cuban troops were sent. In the second battle in 1987, Castro sent 50,000 troops. The uh, South African military fought um, along with um, a large amount of American aid. The Cubans were helped by the Soviets. They were flying the MiG-21s and MiG-23s, and they also used the latest uh, armor in the tank battles against the South Africans. To make a long story short, in uh, the, at the battle called Quito Calabela, the Cuban forces destroyed the South African forces and you had a stalemate. As a result of the stalemate, Castro told the uh, South African forces that they would attack South Africa and that they would invade unless they released Mandela and, that, and also um, in apartheid. When the South Africans balked, Cuba told them that they would bomb Durban and they would bomb Johannesburg because they had gained air dominance. They also stated that they would invade South Africa and they had 150 to 200,000 troops on the Nadimbia border. It was at that point that the president of South Africa released Mandela and ended apartheid. So it's the Cuban forces in that era that releases Mandela and ends apartheid. At the, uh, when, Ma when Mandela was finally released from prison, he went to Cuba for a state dinner, and at the dinner uh, he states very clearly that it is the Cubans who are really the brethren of South Africa because without their help he would still be in Robin's prison and that apartheid would still be in existence. I'm, I'm, I apologize once again for the, the poor speech. Uh, to make a long story short, then as a conclusion, it's the Cuban forces which free Angola, Namibia, and ends apartheid in South Africa. Thank you very much. And completing our, our remarkably and wonderfully international panel, we have uh, uh, Dr. Aurelien Poilbou from the Research Center of the French Air Force presenting on Sub-Saharan Africa as a key issue for France during the Cold War. Until the middle of the 20th century, Africa was regarded as a labor pool as a source of soldier and war material. With the end of World War II, the status of Africa changed. During the Cold War, potential battlefields were not limited, for example, to Europe or Asia. Every part of the world was labeled to be a theater of confrontation between East and West. Africa became a worldwide issue, and particularly a key issue for France. According to French strategists, the military defense of Africa and the war in Algeria were necessary. In the 50s and 60s, French strategists wanted NATO to take into consideration the fact that the war in Algeria was a part of the defense of Europe. For France, during the Cold War, Africa represented the source rank of NATO. A Soviet attack in the Middle East or in Africa would have rendered Europe vulnerable. With this strategy, which may be considered by some as a merely a crazy theory, to justify the Algerian war, does nevertheless explain why, why French strategists turned their attention to Africa. Africa was to be organized militarily as soon as the war was over. In 1960, 60,000 French soldiers were based in 1990 garrison in sub-Saharan Africa and Madagascar. Most of them came back to France after African independence. This reveals a change in strategy. After decolonization, French geopolitical ambition on the African continent was to maintain its status as, as a world power. This ambition had a big influence on local politics and military issues. Paris, Paris began to organize former French colonies 
Oran itself not only to maintain French influence that's in that part of the world, but also with the aim of extending its own influence to former Portuguese, British and Belgian colonies. French influence was in the first place, place political, economic and cultural. However, the military aspect, uh, in particular the bilateral military relationships since the 60s, cannot be ignored. They are the fundamental basis of both the French military presence in Africa and the development of African military forces. For France, these were two means of safeguarding the stability both of new states and of frontiers. This military relationship was not disinterested. It was intended to protect all French national interests as well as those of French people working in Africa. The special relationships became useful, even essential in the 60s and the 80s. In those days, Africa was considered by great power to be a significant issue. During the Cold War, Cuban Russian intervention in Ethiopia, Angola, and Mozambique, and also Libya's expansionist policy transformed Africa into a new battlefield. French former colonies found themselves surrounded by the confrontation. Some of them became rapidly destabilized. In the geopolitical terms, former French sub-Saharan colonies were and still are in a trade and a zone of confrontation between North and Southern Africa. It is also the junction of Arabian civilization and that of other ethnic groups. The Saharan desert has always been difficult to control. It is a ge geographical space which changes depending on the changing relationships between neighbors. As a consequence, in these young states, domestic affairs are inseparable from foreign issues. For example, the population of Chad is divided ethnically, economically, and religion into north and south. This new state adds, the, adds these difficulties to overcome. However, internal crises were often exploited by foreign countries such as Libya, trying to destabilize the new state. Some African countries attempted to defend themselves initially, but confronted with powerful weapons sold to their opponents by the Soviet Union, they had to call on France for help. In this situation, France had no choice but to intervene in order to justify her international political position. Thus, in order to understand why Sub-Saharan Africa was a key issue for France during the Cold War period, one must focus first on bilateral military relations. Then one can consider how France dealt with this crisis through repeated military interventions. After decolonization, most of the country concerned maintained a strong relationship with France. The community of l'Union Française was transformed into a large number of bilateral diplomatic and military agreements. These defense agreements between France and 11 countries from the former French colonial empire were aimed at organizing a true regional defense system. Soon after the end of the Algerian war, Paris understood that a friendly former colony was better than a, than a hostile one, of course, even if it meant helping them toward independence. Some historians argue that if President de Gaulle granted independence to African countries with a delay, it was on a certain implied conditions, namely that there were an independent local policy but a common foreign policy. Defense agreements are the keystone of a common foreign policy. They are supposed to be, to be factors for peace and stability. On the one hand, they limit the risk of the conflict between participating states, and on the other hand, they provide a low-cost safeguard against again, foreign attacks. In peacetime, all the French army needed was a few bases, a small number of troops, or perhaps nothing more than military advisors. France was able to control large parts of African continent without having to maintain a large number of troops. Paris delegated the defense wall to the new states. In return, France safeguarded the stability of borders and also guaranteed the independence of the African states, Senegal, Ivory Coast and Togo, then Burkina Faso, Niger and Mauritania 
was the countries most implicated in the military cooperation. With different treaties on the one hand and political and economic agreements on the other, relations between France and Africa, African countries become very strong compared with classic treaties. The concept of defense applied not only on the international level for which it was intended, but extended by implication to local politics. This common defense agreement was one factor which limited it the, the, the sovereignty of the African states. This led to some countries, such as Guinea, opting to cease all cooperation with France. Mali and Benin chose to align with the East. So the Soviet Union supplied them with weapons, equipment, and military training. <clears throat> to understand the close relationship between France and Africa, there is also the aspect that um, nearly 52,000 African military were trained in France between the 60s and 90s. Uh, for example, Idris Deby and Denis Sassoon Gesso referred to this. Um, <clears throat> this contribute to French military culture being based on to African leaders. Furthermore, uh, military assistance created a technical and military dependence on France. <clears throat> According to African political leaders, France was a guarantee of the stability. Paris engaged in conserving borders and supporting the existing head of state. In Chad, for example, uh, Paris recognized first Tombalbay, then his opponent, Isenabre, who had fought against France in the 70s, but yet became president of Chad from uh, 1982 to 1990. <coughs> Consequently, the part that French diplomacy has played in stabilizing and legitimizing African regime, regimes, above all in French speaking sub Saharan Africa, cannot be ignored. Personal connection <coughs> between head of states are further, further cornerstone in relation between North and South. French foreign policy, especially concerning Africa, was an exclu exclusive domain of the French president. The president special advisor on African and Madagascar affairs, Jacques Focard, <coughs> was at the head of this system of special connection, which may be regarded as a veritable secret of parallel, parallel diplomacy. This aspect of French relations show how, how willing African leaders were to cooperate with France. Of course, most of them, having, having been educated in France, were aware of the importance of France for the economy, and they understood that military cooperation with France was essential to protect their own regimes. <coughs> this French policy became effective from the middle of the 70s to the end of Cold War. At that point, the few Soviet Union adopted a new strategy, the communization of Africa by direct or indirect interventions in former Portuguese colony. Moreover, the Soviet Union sold weapons, fighters, and technology to Algeria and Libya. So, Libya systematically supported secessionist rebellions in the north of Chad, as Libya expressed her intention to extend her frontiers and to undermine French influence in Africa. Paris decided in favor of military intervention from 1978 onwards. These interventions were a realization of interference in the domestic affairs of a foreign country. The French position was not adopted by the other Occidental countries. French President Valéry Giscard d'Estaing didn't succeed in convincing the American President Jimmy Carter to intervene in Africa. <coughs> Unlike the other continents, the USA had no defense pact in Africa. France was apparently the only Western great power implicated in sub Saharan Africa's lot, in a way. Washington preferred to discharge the duty of defending Africa to France. France, allied with the USA, assumed the responsibility for the America's containment strategy in Africa. <coughs> also, President Valéry Giscard d'Estaing and his successors, French, strategy, French strategists abandoned the sanctuary defense, the defense of only home territories with nuclear weapons. More exactly, 
Giscard d'Estaing added to home territory defense, the European defense, and African defense as a, an integral part of the French defense. France, protected by a nuclear deterrence, was able to help her allies. So, Paris could develop a conventional deterrent and a coercive diplomacy in Africa. France aimed to persuade an enemy by the threat of a possible valley violence, but also with a limited and reversible violence. The graduation of the military action as a goal to convincing the enemy, Libya, of the determination of France to defend the sub-Saharan states. Military operations were combined with diplomacy. This operation could be interrupted for negotiations. These operations were no, no, not permanent nor global. They, are, they were localized and not intended to go on forever. However, a French military presence in Chad, Operation Epervier, has continued since 1989 to up to the present day. For example, in 2008, Chadian rebels came from Sudan and attacked N'Djamena. French forces in Chad helped Idris Deby, the Chadian president, by giving him from crucial information by aerial intelligence with which enabled him to defeat the rebellion. This intervention came from France, but, but were based within an east-west line corresponding to sub-Saharan and Central Africa, more specifically in Senegal, Gabon, Cameroon, Chad, Central African Republic, and Djibouti. Exactly the position of the former colonial empire, whose ambition was to rule all over the continent. The use of air power based in Dakar, Bangui, N'Djamena, and Djibouti was aimed at controlling large parts of territories with a quick weapons tactic. Air force capabilities have proved to be more suitable than an army to control large parts of territory. That's why, that's why the African bay air bases were important. Bangui, Franceville, Abéché were also essential to purpose en route to French Island in the ASEAN, Indian Ocean when Algeria, Sibia and Sudan close their airspace to French military aircraft. To conclude, Africa became a strategic issue during the Cold War. French military interventions were a direct consequence of a Soviet military implication. France knew how to keep her influence over the African continent. It cannot be denied that the United States priorities were Europe and Asia. The USA let France manage Africa, or sub-Saharan Africa. They recognized French experience and Washington had no large objective in Africa. During the Cold War, the military defense system organized by France in Africa suited the USA very well, above all when Russia and Cuba intervened in Africa. For France, defense agreements and military intervention in Africa represented an important part of a global defense. Paris organized a military system in Africa built around her own military forces and not a collective and multilateral military system. As a consequence, there is a paradox. The frontiers, political authorities and administration of sub-Saharan and post-decolonization sovereign states depends of depended on France and a foreign country, the former colonial state. To put it in a nutshell, France managed the military instruments that decided the survival of sub-Saharan states. The military relations between France and Africa Countries were both important for France and for African countries. Military relations and interventions were not so were not autonomous, but always an instrument of policy. It revealed words of politically and strategically close relationships between France and Africa's African countries, which continues till today. Thank you much. Uh, thank you very much, all panelists.